welcome to the Sisters for Fitness Wellness Show. I'm Stephanie Gaines Bryant. My guest today is Karen Kendra Holmes, and she is a transgender advocate. Welcome. Hi, Stephanie. How are you? Great, great. I've had you on the show before, and welcome back. Well, thank you for having me back again. Um, I wanted to start off with, uh, Karen, you're doing some really important work right now. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen a rise in the number of transgender people who have been injured or killed mm -hmm. over the last few years. Right. And you've been working with the police, with law enforcement, to help try to reduce those numbers in Prince George's County. Yes, um, actually right now I was, um, after the second murder of one of the trans women in the Fairmont Heights area, uh, Major Wadi from the 3rd District Station uh, called me up and asked me if I would be interested in working on a program to try to help the girls get off the street. And we're talking about uh, sex workers. And so um, actually I went in and sat with Major Wadi for probably about a good hour and a half, which was a very good conversation, you know, knowing that she, her rank, you know, but this is something that she really wanted to tackle and, and get this problem solved. The um, what happened was their officers will be patrolling up and down Eastern Avenue, and if they see some of the girls out there on the street, what they do is push them over to the D.C. side. D.C. would come by and push them back over to Maryland. And so Major Waddy said, I'm really tired of playing this ping pong game. Would you be interested in trying to help you know, these girls to see if we can get them off the street? And I said, absolutely, without a doubt. I would love to help out. <clears throat> so right now I've been out there for probably about good four months, four or five months, I guess. And um, it's been really, really positive, you know, as far as talking with the girls and stuff. When, and I'm actually doing a ride along with the officer that's been assigned especially to work the Eastern Avenue streets. And so what happens is <clears throat> once we see one of the girls or a group of girls, um, the officer will stop. I will get out of the cruiser and walk up to them and say, hey, can I talk to you for a few minutes and stuff like that. And I do go ahead and identify myself t to them as a trans woman, so that way they feel a little less, you know, inhabited that something's going to happen, you know, and they're going to get arrested or something. And I just tell them, no, I'm not a police officer. I'm here to help you. Why <clears throat> is it twice as dangerous for uh, trans women on the streets? It's dangerous on the streets in the first place as a sex worker, right. but why is it twice as dangerous for trans people? I think, you know, it's going to be either a combination of people just don't want us out there, or they don't like trans people, they, you know, what we use the word transphobia, um, and, and then it's possibly that when the person stops for that, per, that girl, they think that maybe that's a real girl, and then they find out that she's not, and then they get maybe met really upset and mad and maybe kill them and hurt them. So. Do you have situations too where uh, trans people are targeted? They know that the person they are dealing with is a trans person and they want to purposely hurt them. Oh yeah, I think very much that's the case in a lot of cases. And some of these girls, and that's like any trans person, once they decide they're gonna come out, it takes a little bit of time to maybe I guess soften up, you know, to look like a woman or their voice might be really deep and heavy. And then they, they know that that's a trans person and they're getting really mad and upset. I think um, when it comes to men, it's maybe a blow on their ego. And that's, I think, the case what's happening, that they get really, really upset and then kill the girl. Some of them are in relationships and then maybe the guy's friends don't know that he's dating a trans woman and then finally they find out they maybe start making fun of the guy or you know teasing them and stuff like that and then the guy gets really upset and then decides to go out and murder this girl in talking to uh these these people what are, what is the main need what are some of the stories that you're hearing well right now you know as a, a trans person is you know we transition to be happy that's first of all but what happens is if somebody, like a job or something like that, says, oh, we don't want you working with us anymore, they've actually lost maybe their family, their children, their homes, their jobs. So what they really want to do is they want to, you know, uh, 
be working because they're also maybe on hormones and stuff like that so they need to pay for all of this and that's why if they've lost their jobs then they're um, basically trying to supplement some kind of way to get food on the table uh, to you know uh, have a place to stay later heads on and then of course uh, for their medication a lot of the girls um, they just they want to continue being who they are but the thing is they need the money to do it and <clears throat> as as far as uh, um having a place to live has that been in uh, a problem as well with there being a lot of homeless transgender people yeah uh what's happening is a lot of the trans women if they decide to go to a shelter you know, it's a women's shelter the clients there at the shelter they don't want to be there with another trans or with a trans person who may look maleish or have still have the male genitalia um, stuff like that and that just pushes them back out on the streets um, there are some places like in dc that will house them but the thing is whether they can get the um, the transportation down into dc and that one place that i definitely know of down there is casa ruby um, she has a really nice place down there and helps the girls do you, um, do, are there enough protections job-wise for trans people? Because it, when you transition, maybe legally they can't fire you because of the transition, but there are ways that if an employer wants to get rid of you, they can get rid of you. Yeah, I think that's a bad issue right there, you know, as far as, you know, they, they trying to, sum up things to make you look bad that you're not a good worker and stuff like that a lot of times when i uh, talk to the girls i talk to them and say hey look if this is something that you're seriously thinking about doing as far as transitioning especially if it's on a job build yourself a platform up so that way when you tell people that you're transgender they can really care less well, well, what do you mean by building a platform? <laughs> I know for me personally, actually in 2015, I did was honored in a magazine called The Platform Magazine. And the t subject in there was uh, up and coming aspiring females with a platform. My platform for me is I do a lot of volunteer work. Um, I do various things in the community. Um, even at work, I was doing a lot of things. So when I actually came out at my agency, there was no issue or a question about it because people knew my heart and that's what I try to get the girls or any transgender person basically is build yourself that platform so when you do tell them they're going to say I don't care I just believe that what you're doing you know is something valuable to our agency and we want to keep you here so you're saying once you build that platform there's no shock in it. People just can accept you for who you are, especially if you've been at a job for a long period of time. Yeah, I've been at my agency now for 18 and a half years, and it's been, you know, really good. Um, when I came out at my agency, um, a lot of people just didn't really care. I knew I was going to have maybe a 5 to 10% of an issue, but it ended up only being like 1% or 2%. So because people knew the things I did, not only at our agency, but also outside of our agency. In talking to these women, are they primarily young? Um, or you've got a variety of folks from all different age groups? The ones that I have met so far in the Fairmont Heights area, and we're talking about on Eastern Avenue where the sex workers are at, um, they're probably in a range so far of maybe 25 to maybe 35 in that range there um none of them look like you know really old or anything like that i can tell uh, people are really surprised when i tell them i'm 63 years old <laughs> you're a good looking 63. <laughs> thanks <laughs> what water are you drinking <laughs> i hope it's water of life out there <laughs> so what are you telling them especially if they need things like job skills and things like that so they can get a better paying job if they were laid off what are some of the things you're telling them well right now when I'm riding with Prince George's County Police and it's a special unit that rides up and down Eastern Avenue and they do it from like 1230 to like maybe 530 in the morning so I'll go out and ride with them like 1230 to maybe three o'clock in the morning and stuff like that unless it's a really slow um, I might cut out a half hour earlier but when I do stop 
and I should say the officer stops the cruiser, I'll get out of the cruiser, the officer will stay in the cruiser and just watch and make sure I'm safe. And then I go up to the girls and I say, hey, um, can I talk to you for a few minutes? And I just want you to know, is there anything that we can do to help you get off the streets? Um, and some of the things that they say they need is one, a ho housing, and then the other thing is, you know, a job. And so uh, I tell them, I say, look, if um, <clears throat> what we'd like to do is maybe meet up with you um, and help you build a resume and also um, <clears throat> to do a one-on-one -on -one interview, mock trial interview with you over the phone. And you know, there are simple needs as well. Uh, for example, things like clothing. You know, if you go out on an interview, the first minute <clears throat> that the employer, that you're eye to eye with that employer makes all the difference. But if you don't have, you know, a decent outfit to wear for the interview, that, that makes all the difference. So, um, in stopping and talking to these girls, you know, basically want to let them know, hey, you know, this is what we want to do to help you get off the street as far as clothing and working our resumes. When we go visit like Goodwill places or Salvation Army, I want to kind of put them on edge to say, hey, look, you know what? People are donating clothes and goods to you and then you're turning around and selling it and making a profit on it. And what I would like you to do is if we send some of these girls to you, Maybe we'll on a, you know, they'll show you a flyer that, that lets you know that they're part of our program and that you can donate clothes back to these girls. So that way when they go for a job interview that they look presentable. And it's in that such a simple thing, it is. just having a, de a decent blouse mm -hmm. to wear um, to an interview so that you can make a positive impression right. on people. I'm actually, when I tell my story, I've actually had a, uh, a woman who's the mother of a trans woman um, up in New York and she actually I interviewed her and her son um, at the Philadelphia Trans Wellness Conference and she knew what I was working on and doing and she actually sent me a box of clothes <laughs> to my house and they were really nice clothes and we gave them out to the girls and you know that was the start and so we get other people not that I want them to send it all to my house. Yes, because I guess you got to start off finding a place that would be interested and willing to store. Absolutely. Uh, and that's the place. our big thing, you know, is finding some place to store the clothes so that way that we can say, hey, go over to this location. There's some clothes there and you can maybe um, try them on and, and get clothes there free. Speaking of your story, it took you a couple of years to make that transition. How did that come about for you? And we're talking about, because it's a new generation now, so it had to be extremely tough for you to come forward and say, this is me and this is what I'm going to do. I mean, I transitioned on October 1st of 2010, so it's been nine years, um, nine glorious years, I'll say. Um, and it's been, the biggest thing I think that I only had an issue with was doubting myself, maybe if this is something I can do. But you know, I kind of went back to the platform thought in my head and I said, you know, people know my heart, you know, they know what I can do. And with that strength and God's help, I said, I'm gonna go out there and just do it. Because if I see at the conference, uh, a five, six and seven year old kid being joyful and happy and their parents are supporting them, um, I said, that could happen easily for me and my family. And it has been really good. You know, the thing is um, with my brother, he said, hey, just give him time to adjust. My dad was okay on and on board for in five minutes after telling him the, my story. And my mom, she's been not only my uh, biggest supporter, but she's very proud of me for the things that I've accomplished since I transitioned. How important is that family in that community in making the transition? Um, I think it's very important that the, the family really holds tight to their child because, I mean, you brought this child into the world and to push them out the door um, is really tough, you know, not supporting them and uh, love your child unconditionally. And um, what's happening a lot of times is the because they've lost their family they're looking to their family which is the trans community 
to uh, support them as far as mentally and, and physically to help them and, and try to help them with clothing, how to pick out clothes, uh, makeup and stuff like that. Some of them have actually <laughs> called me auntie, you know, because that's the role that they see me in. Um, I'm just glad nobody said grandma. <laughs> <laughs> how, how important is the church community, oh, the wow. faith community? It's, I'll tell you, this is what's gonna really knock your socks off about the church. I used to go to the Twinbrook Baptist Church and they ended up shutting down because of the fact there just wasn't enough you know, partition, uh, people coming to the church. And uh, that was really sad because that was an open and welcoming church. Um, and then I ended up going t now to another church, which is Rockville United Church in Rockville, Maryland. And um, there they opened arms and welcomed me into the church. Um, it's very open for the LGBTQ community. And the thing is, they have heard my story about working in Fairmont Heights, helping the uh, girls get off the streets. And I told them about uh, maybe two ride-alongs before <clears throat> that being out there, one of the officers that I rode with a couple of times before, he says, you know that girl that you were talking to? And I go, yeah. And the other girl was signaling her to come on, come on, go, let's go. And then he said the reason why is because her pimp was in the area. So that was really scary for me. And then the fact that there had been three shootings that same week in the same area, and so I mentioned that to the church, you know, when they asked for prayers and praise, um, I told them, just keep me in prayer that I can, you know, work up enough funds to get my own um, bulletproof vest. And what happened was right after service was over, one of the ladies, uh, dear to my heart, you know, she comes up and goes, here, I want you to have this. And I said, no, that's, don't worry about it. She goes, no, you're to take this. And so when I got home, I opened it up and it was $50. A couple of days later, I get a phone call from our LGBT group for the church. And they said to me that, hey, we want to donate some money for you to get a vest, you know, because we believe that you're doing great work out there. And they gave me a limit of like $500. I'm mm -hmm. like, wow. So in the midst of that week, I was um, going through the website and I found a couple of vests that I was interested in. Um, it was, um, one was like 592 and the other one was like 640. And, um, a friend of mine who I do Red Cross with, she calls, we were talking and she goes, um, you should try a Ranger surplus. And I'm like, you know, I go there all the time when I have drill every month. And so I called them up and I said, yeah, we have vests starting off around $300. And it's the same level three vest that I wanted for myself. And so... Um, I went up there and there it was and fit me okay and stuff like that. And uh, the vest came out to like 316 and with my military discount, they only charged me 286. And I was like, that was not only a blessing to me, but a blessing to the church because the church was willing to put that money out for me. And it's also a blessing to the, the, the people who are out there that you are talking to. Right. The fact that this allows you to go out there and to feel safe. Right. Now, how many uh, murders were there last year? Last year there was 24. And after, if give or take, uh, I would say pretty much 22 of them were women of color. And that was nationwide? Uh, yeah, you know, in the United States. Actually, there was like, uh, I wanna say like 300 and something. Uh, worldwide. You just mentioned that it's part primarily women of color. Mm -hmm. Why do you think women of color are being killed at a much higher rate? I, I really don't know that answer. Um, I wish I did because that would give me something else to try to really talk to the girls about. I, don't, I just think probably it's a combination of maybe working the streets. Um, they don't maybe look or they give away something that you know, that they're trans. Actually, one um, lady had told us, one reporter that I was talking to, that the girl said, you know, when she asked her that question about dating and stuff like that, she goes, oh, they'll find out eventually on their own. And I'm like, are you serious? When she told me that, it's like, that's setting yourself up to be either murdered or hurt. Why is telling the truth about who you are so important with this? For me, I mean, I can actually, 
Um, I don't go wearing a T on my chest. <laughs> um, but I actually, when I go out, if there's a guy that wants to take me out on a date, um, I tell them up front. It's like, that way I can disclose everything so that that way they don't maybe spend 75 to $150 on me on dinner. I wish it was $150. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, I'm up front with them right off the bat so that way they won't get upset or mad or pissed off the fact that I didn't disclose this and give them the option of saying, yes, I'll date you anyway or not. What do you see are the differences in generation? Because you said now they're relating to you as auntie. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a younger generation coming up and the world is a little more um, understanding even though we are nowhere near where we should be right. with this. But the world is a little bit more understanding. What are you seeing with this new generation? Well, the one thing that I wish that really we can get across to the younger generation, because they're like off the hip type of kids. They don't care. It's this attitude like, I'm going to be who I am no matter what. You're not going to tell me I can't. My thinking is let's calm them down just a little bit and talk to people in a more softer way to say this is who I am this is where I'm planning on for my life and it's my life you know please accept me for who I am and and I try to tell that to other people when I go do conferences or events is you know we're not here to change your mind but we want you to please respect us for who we are I mean it's like let's put yourself if your child was you know transgender how would you like them to be treated? And um, I actually put that to one of my old neighbors. I got great neighbors now in the neighborhood. <laughs> um, what if one of your children, and she just went totally ballistic. It was like, there's no way my child is gonna be that way and I'll make sure of that. And I'm like, but you never know, you never know. So if we can get them um, to understand that we are human and we're doing great things out there in the world, I mean, you know, we've got military trans people, we've got police, fire. Well, speaking of military trans people, how do you feel about uh, um, what's going on with the military and transgender? I think it's mis misinformation is, you know, our president, you know, believes in and stuff like that. It's funny, I, I wish I could find the exact thing that he did because right after he made his tweet a couple of years ago about the trans people in the military, um, I did an interview um, and of course he commented on my interview and I'm like, wow, you know, and it, it wasn't really bad. It's just he didn't approve of it and stuff like that. And what I was basically saying in my in my interview was I wish he would take the time to come talk to us to find out the things that we're doing in the military and just accept that we're good people. There's um, a lot of the, the command staff, they're they're not gonna get rid of a good soldier who's doing great things for his command. It's like um, there was one particular cartoon article I saw in, in the Express where the president was standing on top of this building and I wanna say it was the Secretary of State but we'll just say it was. And here's a Scud missile coming across the sky heading toward the Capitol and the Secretary of State goes, we could have taken that rocket out of the air but that person was transgender. And I was like, wow, that's, that hits the point because we do have some people that are transgender that can do that too. So as you said, you've got people all over who are doing great things from the military um, to law enforcement and things like that. I wanna uh, ask you to continue the, the great work that you're doing um, with these folks because that is dangerous for you to need a bulletproof vest that says a lot about the hatred yeah. that's out here and that your life could be in danger for for doing something right positive for the community positive for yeah. the community and what is that how do you feel i mean what what inside drives you to open that door and get in that police cruiser um it's putting my trust in god um and the church that I go to now, they're, they're constantly praying for me. They even, when I come to church, they'll go, how's it going? How's the program going and stuff? Like, they're really concerned and, and interested. And we're talking about elderly people like in their 70s, 80s um, from the church that are accepting who I am. 
and they're very proud of me. They're, they're coming up to me saying, hey, we're glad you, you're part of our church. And I'm like, that gives me hope. That gives me confidence to go out there and do something that I think is very important to try to help these girls um, get off the streets. Have you seen some results as a result of you talking to some of these girls? Have you seen some of them kind of take a different path? I haven't just yet because right now I'm building that trust. I tell them, I say, hey, remember this face, okay? And I said, these officers that are riding up and down the street, they're here for your protection. They wanna make sure you stay safe. And actually, two weeks ago when I rode with one, one of the officers, I got out and one of the girls kind of was skipping away a little bit, but she did stop and talk to me. And we talked for probably a good 20 minutes. And I was really, really surprised that she really was grateful that we were out there that she, I was coming out to talk and she's very interested in, in building a resume. Um, the sad part about it, she only is sixth grade dropout. So that's gonna be a little tough, but we're gonna do what we can, so. Yeah, and, and if you're, people are capable of learning. Yes. So you may have a sixth grade education, but that doesn't mean you lack the potential to be great. Yeah, I would love to just put out a challenge to the community say, look, if you've got a job opening for one of the trans people, uh, you know, let me know. Uh, so you can send an email to me or go on my website and put a, uh, a comment in and we'll try to get the girls to you. Because there was one girl that I actually talked with. She knew WordPerfect and Excel. And when she told me that, I'm seeing them inside my heart. I'm like, why is she working the streets then? And probably what happened, like most trans people, is once they transition, they lost their job. Wow. So what we're going to do is at the end of the program, we're going to put your information um, sure. in the credits and see if anybody bites. Because I'm sure there's some, there's some uh, you know, people with the skills that we can match uh, with the different jobs. And, and I mean, just getting one person. Right. If you help one person, that person's going to help another person. So you just never know where things like things like this go with just by opening your mouth <laughs> by saying hey we need this right. what that can lead to I know like uh, um, right now we've got a coalition team uh, in Prince George's County of different organizations and the biggest one is heart to hand and we're working with them they have a mobile unit and we were actually out last couple of weeks ago and we parked on the side and they also we did some testing on the girls and stuff Thank you so much, Karen Kendra Holmes. We will have you on again. Uh, look forward. <laughs> You've been watching the Sisters for Fitness Wellness Show. I'm Stephanie Gaines Bryant. Have a great day.